The general reactivity of polysaccharides is similar to monosaccharides, but certain things can't happen in polysaccharides, in particular because we don't have any hemiacetals within the structure of a polysaccharide, except in the very ends. We can't open to expose an aldehyde or a ketone. And so these generally don't open except under acidic hydrolysis conditions, because rather than dealing with hemiacetals in the structure, we have now acetals. Every monomer unit includes one acetal involving an oxygen connected to the next monomer unit. And these can undergo hydrolysis. The glycosidic linkages can be opened by water only under acidic conditions, where this oxygen gets protonated and departs to form an oxocarbenium ion, and then water comes in to form the hemiacetal. Polysaccharides still include a very large number of alcohol groups, and these are susceptible to, for example, oxidation, nucleophilic substitutions with electrophiles like alkyl halides and acyl halides, and the proton here is mildly acidic. But as in the monosaccharides, we can't really selectively react one hydroxyl group in these reactions, and so typically we'll use a very large excess of base and the alkylating or acylating agent in order to do substitution reactions at these hydroxyls. We can think of polysaccharides just as monosaccharides that have undergone anomeric substitution over and over and over again with the next monosaccharide along the chain. What this means is that we can get back the monosaccharide units through a hydrolysis process, and the essence of the hydrolysis process we've really seen already in the conversion of, say, a glycoside back to a monosaccharide. The essence of the process is nucleophilic substitution with water as the nucleophile. So how does this work mechanistically? Well, in the first elementary step, we protonate the oxygen that's going to depart as a leaving group. And it helps, I think, here to focus on the glycosidic linkage, and in particular on the acetal that's part of the glycosidic linkage. So here we have an acetal. Here's an anomeric carbon, an oxygen that's linked to an alkoxy group, and a second oxygen that's also linked to an alkoxy group. And so one way hydrolysis can proceed is through protonation of this oxygen that's part of the next monosaccharide in the sequence, preparing for that oxygen to act as a leaving group. So let's just use H plus to keep things a little bit more condensed. And then I'll draw the protonated polysaccharide in a somewhat condensed form, taking out all of these extra hydroxyls, which are kind of extraneous to the process anyway. After this proton transfer has occurred, we've primed this bond to break, essentially, in a D sub N or a beta elimination step if we note that this oxygen has the ability to induce cleavage of the CO bond. This leaves us with an oxocarbenium ion, an oxygen-stabilized carbocation, in other words, and also with a remaining polysaccharide chain. And so if this is happening on the end of the polymer chain, we've just got a polysaccharide with one fewer monosaccharide unit. Or if this is happening in the middle, we've just broken the chain in half to neutralize the oxocarbenium ion, water now enters the picture as a nucleophile, and through an A sub N or an AD sub N elementary step, a bond forms between oxygen and the anomeric carbon. This leads to what is essentially the conjugate acid of the final monosaccharide, with water coordinated either above or below. The squiggly line indicates that we don't really know what the configuration of the anomeric carbon is. And finally, deprotonation at that position ultimately gives us the neutral monosaccharide unit. So repeated application of this mechanism ultimately chews up a polysaccharide chain into single monosaccharide units. And all it is, is repeated application of the acid-catalyzed SN1 mechanism we saw before with proton transfer, beta elimination, which cleaves the key CO bond in the glycosidic linkage, AD sub N by water, which reestablishes a CO bond and ultimately leads back to a hemiacetal, after the fourth step, which is proton transfer, to get the acid catalyst back.